think John is online here. Good. Um, good afternoon, good, good morning to all friends and colleagues. Uh, am I visible? Professor, good to see you. You are. Nice to see you. It's been a while now. It's been a while, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I hope you're well. Good, thank you. Thank you. And, yeah. uh, in Norwegian, we say no Rus Mubarak, although it's not that in Afghanistan, I know. <laughs> yeah. Not too far away, yeah? March. No, no, I know. I don't know what we can say with hopes also this year. Mm -hmm. Hard to tell. Mm -hmm. Salam. Salam, salam. Salam. Salam, Bahama. Hello. Hi, Elizabeth. Salam. Hi. Hi, Mitra. Hello. Salam, Fred. Salam, Salam, salam. Salam, Bashamal. Salam, Bashamal. Salam, and also to Miss Heidi and Farooq Saib. Elizabeth, just a question. Is it Aida or Aid? It's Aida. Aida. More with an E than with an A. And uh, I only understand a few sentences of Doris. I would uh, be very happy if you could uh, mostly speak English, unless you have something very personal you don't want to share with me. I think yeah. the whole event is in English. Yeah, I know, but uh, yeah, you know. Yeah, I think your, your first is better than what you think, Elizabeth. Nachair, Hubnist. But if anyone asks anything in Farsi, I'll just translate it. I think all these people are very capable. Misha, uh, could you please just let us how how is the run on the show? If you could just tell us a bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just just as I wrote in the WhatsApp group, um, yeah. I'll start with a very short introduction of the, the webinar, the um, focus of this, and a background to Norway's uh, um, involvement in Afghanistan uh, and Afghanistan's peace process, and then I'll go to um, some remarks that we have had about the official representative from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Norway, and then I will introduce the speakers. I'll ask uh, the speakers for a for an introductory remark. Please, um, please be cautious of time as well because we don't want the audience to be, you know, to just listen and to, we don't want to waste their time like not interacting and just listening. So give uh, us a time uh, limit for that first remark. Then one minute was it? Yeah, for the yeah. introductory one remarks, minute. I will go for two to three minutes, maximum okay. three minutes. Okay, and then I will come back to everyone uh, based on the order of the questions and ask them the question and mm -hmm. you will have eight minutes to reflect on that. That's all mm -hmm. right. So uh, everybody will be reflecting on each uh, question or uh, uh, how is, or just there is the, the, the questions that you already shared, we will uh, focus yeah, on. Yeah, those are the questions that I shared because I mean, I wouldn't ask the questions in the very beginning. I'll just ask you to reflect on uh, just an introductory remark, very okay. briefly what you're going to talk about. And then I'll ask the question later. And after everyone has spoken about the, uh, the topic and discussed, I'll give, I'll ask the questions which is posed by the audience. We'll go through the audience questions and I'll read them and, and, and you know, raise it to anyone who's going to address. Okay. Thank you. Yes, I'm the only one that's sort of representing Norway here, but uh, I will try to deal with that. And I'm not representing any ministry or government. I'm an independent academic and journalist. So you bear that in mind, please. Um, I but I try to understand what Norway is doing. <laughs> I think everyone would have between um, 10 to 12 minutes of time all together like two to three minutes introduct introduction and then eight mm -hmm. minutes of uh, reflecting on the questions. I think we um, we have everyone except Dr. Sarabi. Uh, we will wait for her in two minutes and we will go online. 
still early morning where she is, I guess. Yeah, it's early morning in uh, the US, so about um, eight o'clock. Okay. Mm -hmm. Hello, can you hear me? Okay, good. I, I cannot hear anybody, sorry. Uh, so, oh, have you turned up your volume? Have you turned uh, up your okay, volume? Okay, I got it. I got it. That's good. Thank you. Andon? Andon John. Are you, how is the questions when you receive them from the audience? Because I believe everyone is not a in this room that we are, I, I don't know Zoom that much. Um, um, if, if, I mean, if the audience puts a question in the um, attendance room, then I will post it to you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Post it on the chat, I see, pres presume then, right? Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> Let me send a text to Dr. Sarobi. Mm -hmm. Other than this, we will start. Um, it was on to be cautious of the time, maybe we should go on. And then uh, when we have Dr. Sarabi, um, then we will give her the floor uh, to, yeah, then we will introduce her. But before, um, until she's joining, we'll start officially in, in going with introduction, set, introductory remarks or introduction session, then probably she will be able to join us. Shall we start? Uh, Salam alaikum. <clears throat> ah. So welcome to today's webinar, everyone. And um, it's about Norway's uh, role in peace talks with the Taliban. Norway's peace engagement in Afghanistan dates back to 2006, when it established contacts with the Taliban to encourage the group to participate in a political <clears throat> with the Afghan government. Norway has acted as facilitator for talks between the Taliban leadership and the Karzai government and subsequently the Ghani government as a channel between the US and the Taliban and as facilitator of an informal confidential regional dialogue on Afghanistan. Norway was one of the very few countries which participated in the Afghan peace negotiations held in Doha in 2020 up to 2021. After the Taliban took control of Afghanistan in August 2021, 
Norway continued its contacts with the Taliban, hosted the representatives of the Taliban in Oslo from 23rd to 25th of January 2022 to meet the Norwegian authorities, representatives of the international community, as well as Afghan civil society. Norway expected that the Taliban authorities would comply with Afghanistan's national and international obligations, work towards more representative governance, and improve the human rights situation. In addition, Norway acts as the pen holder for Afghanistan in the United Nations Security Council, which shows the country's strong involvement in the political affairs of Afghanistan and its important role in international efforts aiming to help the country. So today's webinar focuses on the Norway's interest in political situation of Afghanistan and its efforts in engaging the Taliban in dialogue. I'm Mitra Kut. I'll be moderating today's webinar, and I am currently supporting the research and communications at Center for Information Resilience. My views at today's webinar do not represent my organization. And we have six speakers uh, for today's webinar. Uh, we were we had requested the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Norway uh, for a, an official representative to participate in today's webinar. We exchanged many messages with them, including and they had their own views and some uh, concerns about the title of the event. We asked them to share their views about the title with other speakers, uh, and we could jointly de decide on the title, uh, but they refused to do so, and they decided that they would not participate in the very end. Um, this act, we believe that Norway's, Norway claims either that it's a democratic country, but is something different in practice. Um, anyways, I'd like to introduce the other speakers. Um, I will then request the speakers uh, for their introductory remarks. I will start with introducing the speakers. So in the panel of today, we have Mr. Yusuf Afurzai, Ambassador of Afghanistan to Norway. We have Mr. Nasir Ahmad Fayek, Charge of Affairs of Afghanistan. Charge of Affairs of the Permanent Mission of Afghanistan to the UN in New York. Um, professor Elizabeth Ida, she is a journalist, writer, and professor emerita in journalism studies at Oslo Metropolitan Un uh, University. Uh, Dr. Habiba Sarobi, former member of Islamic Republic of Afghanistan Peace, Peace Negotiations Team to Doha. Mr. Tabish Furo, researcher and policy analyst and Dr. Vidal Mehran, lecturer at Department of Politics and the director of MA in Conflict Security and Development at the University of Exeter. So I'll kick off with the introductory remarks of Mr. Nasir Ahmad Fayed, and I'll go to other speakers as well. They will have two to three minutes to um, talk about and state the, uh, the, the topic and issue that they're going to cover in today's webinar. So, Mr. Fayek, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, good morning and good afternoon and warm greetings uh, to the distinguished panelists and, and to all respectful participants joining us in this webinar from different time zones. And I want to thank Afghan Institute for Strategic St Studies um, for organizing this Zoom webinar and for inviting me to this discussion. I think uh, that today's uh, webinar is important as there are different perspectives and interpretations among the Afghan people in general uh, and uh, some critics uh, of engagement with the Taliban. And I hope that this discussion can contribute on the, uh, to the ongoing efforts of uh, international community and their understanding of people's expectations and can shed light on some misconceptions and misperceptions uh, about engagement with the Taliban, as well as complexities of peace efforts. Uh, I will try to focus in today's uh, um, uh, webinar on Norway's role as a former pen holder of Afghanistan's file at the Security Council, UN Security Council, and its priorities in peace efforts towards Afghanistan. And I will also touch upon some sensitive aspects of international communities engagement with the Taliban and particularly Afghan people's uh, appeals and expectations. Thank you so much, Mr. Fayek. Um, Professor Elizabeth, Ida, would you go ahead with an introductory remark? Thank you. Thank you very so much. I uh, just want to mention, since uh, I'm not Afghan, that I've uh, visited the country and followed the development in Afghanistan since 1980, more or less. So uh, 
it's a long time. And uh, I've co-written a book on Afghanistan as well and some research articles also. Uh, first, I want to say that uh, Norway's foreign policy, if you summarize it in one sentence, it's small country with big ambitions. And uh, we look at the history. Uh, this year is 30 years since the uh, so-called Oslo Agreement, which uh, was a result of the negotiations uh, where Oslo was uh, heavily involved with uh, Palestine and Israel. And if you look at the situation there today, you may say that there is a difference between, let's say, peace agreements and the situation on the ground and the implementation. So I think the implementation with a big eye is a major issue to discuss in this panel. Furthermore, uh, I could refer very briefly to the Goudal report, which was our foreign minister of foreign affairs, who made, uh, who headed a large report about Norway's engagements in Afghanistan, which concluded that it had little positive effect, except for the fact that Norway pro proved itself as a very solid and staunch ally of NATO. So uh, more to come. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Elizabeth Ida. I would go to uh, Dr. Habiba Sarabi for her introductory remark. Please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, warm salam to everyone and uh, good afternoon, uh, good morning. Uh, thank you very much. And I will talk about the Norway background about the to be engaged with the peace process in different area and different country, and also uh, their rule as a um, uh, as a country that call for making peace or peace building or peacekeeper. So how Norway can play a role for uh, uh, peace process and upon on uh, in, in in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sarabi. Uh, Mr. Tobish Baruch, would you like to present your introduction? Sure. Uh, thank you so much for the invite. Uh, hello to everyone, to the panelists, to the audience. Uh, uh, I will focus on my talks on uh, the problematic nature of the Norway's engagement with Afghanistan. I believe there is a moral discrepancy, a political uh, uh, difference of uh, values and the consistency of Norway's foreign policy regarding different conflicts in Afghanistan, in, in the world and including in Afghanistan. Uh, I will uh, elaborate on the fact that uh, Norway has been a party to the Afghanistan conflict since December 2000, 2001, and the last Norwegian soldier left Afghanistan uh, in August uh, 2021. So the very fact presenting Norway as the facilitator, mediator, negotiator, initiator of peace process in Afghanistan depends on how we understand Norway's engagement with Afghanistan, particularly its engagement with NATO forces, its very leading uh, influence in shaping uh, the U.S. thinking toward peace, and of course its participation in ISOF and NATO engagement throughout the so-called global war on terror. So the very uh, logic of NATO's engagement with Afghanistan needs to be understood in a very broader context. So I will elaborate on that points in my talks. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tobish. It's a very, very interesting and informative session. It's going to be. Uh, Mr. Ghafurzai, would you like to go ahead and state the introductory remarks for your talk? Well, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon and good morning to all colleagues online. Um, first and foremost, I want to thank AISS for the invitation to this uh, discussion and this webinar. It really, it really is a great pleasure to be part of the program and among a good group of panelists and some friends and colleagues. Um, Norway has been among the countries that have been engaged in Afghanistan uh, with important contributions in Afghanistan for decades now, not just during the post-2001 democratic phase in Afghanistan. I think I can say with confidence that the people of Afghanistan still do have very fond memories of Norwegian humanitarian support during the 1980s, during this former Soviet occupation, which indeed was another difficult period in Afghanistan's modern history. With regard to peace diplomacy efforts, uh, I can say that it's been part of its broader engagement covering the areas of security, development, women's rights, and human rights. In terms of um, the context of today's discussion, we all know that a year and a half has now passed since the Taliban's forced takeover of Afghanistan. And unfortunately, 
we all are seeing the situation worsen and become more complicated with the people of Afghanistan suffering now from a very tragic situation and a crisis that continues to deepen. The situation is as such, despite the international community's engagement with the Taliban in hope of being able to influence their decisions in favor of the interests of the people. Meanwhile, it also seems that now the international community for the first time in a, in a, in a long time is in a phase of contemplating whether or not the Taliban are capable or even interested in dialogue, negotiations and compromise. And also considering what, if any, new measures should be taken to impact the situation in a positive way. I think that decision should not just be informed of, or should not be informed by developments of the past 15 months alone, but rather by the outreach and compromise that has been made with the Taliban over a more extensive period in Afghanistan and globally. So I will focus my remarks on, on that issue before making a few points about Norway's peace diplomacy efforts so far, and also some suggestions on what new measures can be taken internationally from here. Thank you very much, Mr. Kapurzai. And Dr. Vida Mehran, would you like to state your uh, introductory remark? Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all the audiences joining us from different parts of the world. Uh, and thank you for AISS for this very interesting and timely panel on a very important issue. So during my uh, brief uh, introductory talk later, we will um, I will discuss um, whether the Taliban are capable or interested in dialogue, are they in, in negotiations and um, what kind of, uh, based on experiences of this first time around that um, a, a troops withdrawal agreement was signed with the Taliban and the promises that the Taliban made, did they deliver those promises? And are, is the Taliban as, a, um, as an insurgent group now in charge of the country and ruling Afghanistan, is it able to make compromises? And what are those challenges facing the Taliban in terms of making compromises, uh, in terms of governance, in terms of ruling Afghanistan, uh, inclusivity and issues, uh, political issues that, and social and economic issues that the country is struggling with and the Taliban as a ruling body in Afghanistan, um, whether it will be able to make um, deliver on promises, any promises that they will make in future negotiations and future talks and how they have actually performed so far in terms of previous uh, uh, previous uh, agreements that they have signed and uh, the uh, promises that they have made. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Uh, it's going to be a very comprehensive uh, talk and discussion about whether really Norway is chasing a unicorn in its uh, Taliban's uh, peace diplomacy with the Taliban or not. Um, I will start with posing questions from our speakers. Um, I would like to start with uh, Mr. Nasir Ahmad Fayek. Um, I would like to ask, how do you assess the, the role of Norway as a pen holder for Afghanistan at the UN? And in light of that, how can you, one conclude the priorities and the guiding principles of Norway's foreign policy, of course, including its uh, diplomacy and peace diplomacy with the Taliban? Um, thank you. Uh, First of all, um, I don't want to focus on bilateral relations of Afghanistan and Norway uh, because my colleague uh, uh, Ambassador Rapuzay already touched upon that, and then that's um, that's very uh, uh, comprehensive. And I just would like to focus on the role of Norway as penholder of Afghanistan for the last uh, for the past two years. And um, I would like to um, uh, point out that since Norway became the penholder of Afghanistan in 2021 and also 2022, uh, just concluded in uh, December 2022, uh, their main focus has always been uh, strengthening international support uh, for Afghan people. And they have always tried to stick to the values, to the uh, democratic values and to the uh, uh, principles of international uh, law and also international humanitarian law and international human rights law. And they, they have always tried to support the people of Afghanistan and were very vocal on very core issues 
on the Taliban and um, uh, and uh, always uh, raise the, their, their concerns about the erosion of respect for the human rights and, and rights of uh, particularly women and girls and their lack of access to education and to fundamental freedoms. And they have always stated that, and they are at different levels. The foreign minister in the last, in the, uh, last meeting held in December, 2022, uh, uh, she was very vocal and stated and, uh, about the, uh, on the Taliban's engagement and the role of Norway. And I just want to quote that uh, she has mentioned that <clears throat> they have always they will judge Taliban by their actions, not by their words. And, uh, and they were also disappointed by the Taliban's actions and, and uh, engagement and their, their behavior. So it means that uh, um, they did their best and uh, for the people of Afghanistan, they are doing with a good intention. They have been supporting the people of Afghanistan, but uh, the complexity of the engagement at the international level is, is very sensitive. It's not easy. Some of the engagements at different levels happen bilaterally or uh, at, uh, and, and this, uh, I will later touch upon this, that why it, the engagement is very sensitive. And just would like to say that uh, at the UN Security Council, they have uh, been very successful, especially in some of the uh, uh, organizing some very important meetings such as ARIA Formula meeting that uh, uh, it was held in October uh, in a closed ARIA Formula meeting. They discussed the engagement uh, with the Taliban and also about their actions. They invited the briefers from Afghanistan, the uh, special representative. And uh, uh, also another uh, milestone is the um, uh, adoption of the UNAMA mandate. And that was uh, another important uh, um, step because uh, in the past, there were some disagreements about the adoption of uh, UNAMA mandate. It's not easy always. There are different perspectives on the mandate of UNAMA, but they were uh, able to extend it for one year and also uh, a robust uh, mandate, uh, which, which is very important right now for Afghanistan and for the people of Afghanistan, uh, the role of UN. We have been always stating that the UN should have a strong uh, role at the, um, in Afghanistan in terms of political engagement, not only focusing on humanitarian aspects or human rights, but on all aspects. Uh, uh, and, and they were able to manage that one. And also it's very difficult in the situation, in the Security Council when there are different perspectives and different, um, uh, there are uh, diverse and, uh, views and, and also um, uh, some polarization among the members. And uh, Norway has been trying to, uh, to, to bridge the gaps and trying to, uh, um, uh, find some uh, consensus on very uh, critical issues. So this is not easy, but uh, overall, they have mentioned that their engagement with the Taliban is not giving legitimacy mm -hmm. to the Taliban. This is very, uh, this has been very clear. And they, they have always um, uh, mentioned that uh, Norway is engagement with the Taliban is to, to protect the human rights and also to uh, to support the humanitarian situation in Afghanistan, and uh, and they have on on the core issues such as uh, uh, fighting uh, with uh, counterterrorism, they have always raised their concerns on on the issue of inclusive government and inclusivity, particularly the participation, uh, full and equal participation of women in in the system, in the governance. They have been very much vocal and stated that. And these things show that they have very uh, strong position on the on the principal issues, and um, the sensitivity of engagement comes when there are uh, people of Afghanistan. Uh, uh, it, it's it, it dates back to the uh, peace process when it started in in uh, even during the former uh, president uh, Karzai. Uh, there were the issue is about the ownership. Uh, who should have the ownership of the peace process. And, and this comes uh, uh, with um, credibility, which country is credible or reliable or have uh, a good reputation to engage and facilitate the peace diplomacy. And uh, Norway has a long history of peace uh, making and peace uh, 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 facilitation. And we know from the 
uh, Middle East, uh, the, the signing of between Palestine and Israel and uh, in 1990s and also other engagements in the in Colombia, the successful uh, agreement signed. And based on that, Norway has a good uh, and credible reputation. But uh, uh, the problem is that um, I, maybe Ms. Dr. Sarabi can also um, uh, share more information on that. When the negotiating team of Afghanistan, uh, when the, the negotiation started in 2020s, uh, there was a stalemate between the Taliban and negotiating team. And uh, there was a discussion that uh, maybe there is need for a facilitator or a, a mediator, a third party to, to intervene and, uh, and uh, kickstart the negotiations because uh, Taliban were not ready to engage with the, uh, and I think this was mainly on the uh, negotiating the agenda of the peace talks uh, between the two uh, uh, negotiating teams. And there was a group of uh, mediators or friends of uh, that they showed their flexibility and they were willing to host and Norway, uh, Indonesia, Germany, uh, Uzbekistan and uh, uh, Qatar uh, were five key countries that they were very much uh, supportive and willing to and ready to host uh, or to facilitate um, between the two, the two teams. And uh, uh, when when engagement comes, uh, always uh, uh, there are of course doubts, and and um, uh, the question of legitimacy is very much important, especially when the Norway hosted the Oslo conference uh, with the Taliban. Uh, people were uh, since the frustration of the people and and also the uh, anger of the people about the behavior of the Taliban and their their uh, strict uh, policies and fundamental uh, uh, ideologies on particularly the provision of women and all these things, people think that when engagement with the Taliban uh, starts or any country is willing to engage with Taliban, it means that they are uh, normalizing their relations or develop or improving their relations. But uh, that's the main doubt and that's the main criticism by the people. And, uh, and this is something that uh, uh, people demand some kind of transparency and also credibility that uh, especially with, with participation of uh, or uh, participation of the uh, uh, part invitation of participants in the peace talks or in such conferences, people have their own doubts that who is negotiating on our behalf because uh, we have very, I mean, not only all Afghans have uh, uh, very bad experiences from the peace talks. And, and that's why they want that who is negotiating and on who is a reliable person. And they want, uh, they think that for the past 20 years, uh, um, Afghanistan uh, was supported, the people of Afghanistan and Norway and all uh, international partners made commitments and, con and uh, uh, made a lot of progress in terms of human rights, women rights and uh, democratic values. And now these countries are uh, acting in contrast and engaging with those groups that they were uh, against these values. And how come this shows a kind of I'm sorry, I have to interrupt you in, in, in here because we have to be cautious of okay. time. We'll okay. come back to you with, with a couple of questions later after okay. all speakers have had their remarks and their uh, discussions. Thank you very much, Ms. Fire. Um, I would like to ask uh, Professor Elizabeth Ida uh, about the criteria and conditions um, for a country to become a mediator, because as uh, Mr. Fayek also mentioned, Norway has tried to act as a penholder for Afghanistan at UN Security Council and tried to mediate uh, in the peace talks as well. Um, did Norway possess these criteria for mediating, hmm. particularly considering that Norway is a member of uh, NATO? Um, I, I'd also like to ask you to be cautious of time. Um, uh, because we'll come back to you uh, with some other questions as well, and you'll have time mm -hmm. to reflect on that. I'll Thank try you. my best. Uh, there is certainly a historic narrative which goes uh, far uh, longer back in history than to the post-Cold War, which is the main period that Norway has engaged in peace negotiations. I don't think there exists uh, an international uh, set of criteria to become a negotiator as such. And I have to say one thing, one word is knowledge. I have a feeling that many people who claim to be to understand Afghanistan 
do not understand Afghanistan enough to really sense the uh, situation either on the ground or between the different factions. So that's number one. Number two is that um, there has been, uh, I mean, one criteria might be, well, you're a small country and it has been said uh, to Norway's advantage that Norway is not a member of the EU, but certainly we're a member of NATO as uh, several of uh, the speakers have rightly addressed. And uh, I was recently in a radio debate with a representative of the MFA actually about uh, the current situation for women in Afghanistan. And uh, I said that, well, do you think sincerely that Taliban leaders will listen to a country which has been part of an alliance that has uh, time and again bombed their positions and also civilian people to a large extent. Uh, we can discuss the war for hours, we don't do that now, but I'm talking about the willingness of Taliban to accept such uh, negotiators and their views. I think uh, perhaps not, and I also said that perhaps it would be more wise to work with or to listen to the surrounding nations who are Islamic nations and who have not engaged in such a way in the recent war in Afghanistan. And uh, some others, uh, among them, some reporters have repeated those words after that. So perhaps there's something in that. Also, when we talk about inclusive and not inclusive, if we go back to 2001, when the uh, way in which the Bond government was set up did not take into consideration to try to include some of the then more moderate Taliban, which might have made a different situation. And the same happened with the, the Trump, uh, uh, let's call it diplomacy with the Taliban where he did not include any other then sitting governments. I mean, there's, there is a history of non-inclusiveness that has been very bad for Afghanistan and Norway has also in a way been part of that. And then I think what they did in Surya Moria in Oslo was perhaps a way of trying to mend that but based perhaps on an idea that they didn't see the consequences uh, when it comes to uh, this being taken by the Taliban leaders as a way to uh, flag it as an international recognition, which I think is a fact that they tried to do that. I've uh, studied Afghan media for, uh, for quite some time uh, before and after. So uh, I think that's a fact that they use this very much. And now we are meeting with international representatives. I mean, they didn't talk so much about Norway as they talked about more in general that now we are meeting with international. I am not against dialogue. And I have to say for a peace process and a criterion perhaps for a peace process is listening and knowledge, having much knowledge, uh, creating confidence, creating a dialogue, and then of course, engaging with civil society and then both civil society in Afghanistan and uh, the international organizations who can claim or uh, justify their belonging to civil society. I think uh, what I see today, where there is some grains, of rays of hope, is where you see NGOs and also to an extent the UN trying to engage with local leaders who are not so ideologically infected in what the top ranks of Taliban are and trying there and also succeeding at least in distributing aid and also uh, at times being allowed to have uh, women's education, although it seems the situation is tightening and it's going for the worse. So uh, I'm not very optimist. And to conclude then, I'd say that uh, what a historian has said about Norway is that, uh, well, uh, it might be good foreign policy what Norway has done in uh, peace negotiations and in Afghanistan included, but to a varying degree has it created peace. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Yeah, I've got a couple of questions about which side Norway was when they hosted the Taliban in January 2022 last year. Uh, were they beside uh, people of Afghanistan or or the Taliban? Uh, and, and you've got... Um, I mean, I'm not in that either or that thing here. Yeah. Right. In the very end. Yeah, but um, I mean, people would decide if Norway had really contributed in peace uh, for the past year. Um, Thank you. I'll go to um, Dr. Habiba Sarabi. She is the member of the. She was the member of the peace negotiations team in Doha, um, and I would like to ask her how does she assess or how do you assess the role of uh, Norway in peace diplomacy from your experience? Floor is yours, Dr. Sarabi. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh... Uh, let me do this uh, moment to congratulate uh, AISS for all the initiative that it's uh, taking for the um, peace, peace and also talk about the security 
and uh, the Herat uh, security um, dialogue is, is one of the best and uh, the same. And uh, I hope that, uh, I wish uh, all the success for the AISS for all uh, its effort and also initiative. Um, about the Norway, um, how to assess Norway, uh, if we can see the, the history of Norway to be engaged with the peace process starting from 90s with the Israel and Palestine, the first uh, uh, peace occur and the second peace occur and also its involvement with the different other country like Guatemala and the, uh, especially on Sudan, uh, the government of Sudan and the uh, South Sudan and bringing the uh, civil society on the uh, peace process. These are the initiatives that uh, Norway uh, has been taken. And uh, the last one with this, uh, with the uh, fork in the government of, of uh, Colombia and but uh, also with the other uh, facilitator or grantor like uh, Cuba. Uh, these are the uh, good example that Norway uh, has been taken. But uh, there are some other uh, uh, failure like uh, Sri Lanka or some other country. Uh, of course, uh, Norway are uh, claiming that always the uh, peace process cannot be success and there might be some failure, but uh, we have to think and, and consider that uh, also uh, mm, uh, the power in the world is, is now a change and, and, uh, and the, the whole uh, system and uh, evacuation have been changed uh, in the world. So that's why it, is, uh, it, it should be considered some more uh, um, uh, experience. Uh, Norway had, uh, uh, Norway had uh, engagement with the peace process uh, when we were in Doha starting from 2000. Uh, uh, 20, uh, some uh, with some other country, uh, for example, as uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Faik said, uh, Uzbekistan, Indonesia, uh, and uh, Qatar. Uh, so, of course, including UNAMO, but after the, uh, I mean, inauguration of the the talk, uh, two other two uh, two country like Uzbekistan, Indonesia they disappeared. They were not there uh, to uh, observe or to follow up all the negotiation process. But Norway with Germany, with UNIMO, these were the country that uh, always uh, uh, following uh, uh, the negotiation. And as a, a peace support team, uh, always uh, uh, they were involved uh, with, this, uh, with, the, with the process. Of course, uh, mm, I mean, Qatar claimed that uh, they will be uh, a good facilitator. And uh, at the end, uh, as, <coughs> excuse me, as Ms. Aide said, that one of uh, uh, the, the, all mentioned about the criteria of uh, mediator, but uh, one of them can be this uh, uh, impartiality. But in, in Doha, uh, unfortunately, Qatar didn't took the uh, was not able to uh, to take this uh, uh, impartiality uh, among uh, for as a facilitator. So um, what what was wrong with the, all the decision and uh, or all the process in uh, in uh, Qatar? It's another chapter. It's another uh, issue that can be discussed. But there are some issue uh, behind the curtain uh, between U.S. and also Qatar that they. Uh, um, Qatar selected as a, a facilitator and mediator. Uh, um, uh, however, at the end of the negotiation uh, process, uh, there was agreement between all the peace support group that um, uh, there should be a medi mediator to, uh, to mediate between the two groups uh, and UNAMO could uh, bring a, um, as an expert uh, for that. But uh, the process was so slow that it didn't happen. And the uh, collapse happened. Unfortunately, the peace process was not, uh, mm, uh, was not successful. So um, assisting, uh, assessing all these process 
uh, and also the issue of uh, NATO about the uh, peacekeeper uh, um, country. At the same time, uh, it will Norway is a part of the NATO, and uh, Norway had uh, uh, some troops. And uh, um, however, at the beginning, it was technical uh, troop, technical uh, uh, people in the north part of of the country. But at the end, they had they uh, brought some. Um, um, uh, arm uh, group, also the plane, I mean, um, uh, a plane, military plane. So these are the question that how uh, the Norway can uh, uh, take the confidence of Taliban and the other uh, Afghan people or Afghan groups. But it is uh, in conclusion to, to uh, uh, say to say that it is. Uh, however, there were some failure, but still uh, uh, time is open and with uh, taking all the oppor opportunity that uh, people of Afghanistan is, is uh, really um, fed up and tired with war and also conflict in Afghanistan and uh, many of uh, the majority of people of Afghanistan wants peace if Norway can take uh, uh, some major uh, step for uh, negotiation and start some back channel from uh, with the different other country that uh, like uh, they did it in Colombia uh, with uh, Russia with China with uh, Indonesia, one of the Muslim country that uh, maybe Taliban can trust to that. So uh, in, uh, Norway can start some back channel for facilitation of peace process. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Sarabi. This will also raise the uh, question of, okay, so if Taliban can trust Norway, how about Norway and the world, would they trust Taliban? Uh, I think we should come back to this question after everyone's remarks have been done. Um, it's, I think I'm going to ask a question from Mr. Tobish. Um, do, you, do you think that Norway has been transparent, impartial, credible in its efforts um, uh, in light of what uh, Ms., uh, Mr. Sarobi, Dr. Sarobi said? And uh, did Norway's efforts contribute to mainstreaming and legitimizing the Taliban, especially when they, um, despite the disagreements and protests around the world in Europe and Afghanistan, not to give platform to the Taliban? Do you think it did contribute to mainstreaming and legitimizing the group? Or is there a ground for Norway to apologize for its contribution to empowering the Taliban? And did Norway try to, to mend what it did, uh, did not consider the people of Afghanistan and completely ignored? Because we saw that there were people saying that this measure and this attempt of Norway giving platform to the Taliban was kind of a slap to the faces of the victims of Taliban's atrocities. So would you please uh, shed light on this? Thank you. Not just the Taliban victims, but also the victims of the international coalition forces, including NATO, which including Norway, which was a member of the NATO forces later on, but initially member of the International Security Assistance Forces coalition that toppled the government of the Taliban following the 9-11 attacks. Unfortunately, when it comes to transparency, not just Norway, but the rest of the world that seemed to uh, pretend that they were on the side of the people of Afghanistan, on the sides of the values and presenting what is best for the people of Afghanistan. They never uh, intended to practice transparency, to let their constituent in the West or the people of Afghanistan know about the extent of their relationship with the Taliban and their implication and the implication of their engagement with the Taliban. Let me bring uh, this uh, interesting point. Unfortunately, there is a tendency with the historical analysis of the Norway's diplomacy that there is a tendency of leaning toward the dominant force in the conflict. For example, the two major cases, the Oslo Peace Accord and the uh, uh, Norwegian peace efforts in Myanmar, showed that unfortunately in both cases, uh, the Norwegian diplomats and the Norwegian establishment somehow lean toward, for example, in the, in the, in the, in the Oslo, peace accord toward the Israeli forces, making Palestinians uh, uh, questioning the whole impartiality of the, 
of the Norwegian engagement. Of course, there were shortcomings from the Palestinian leadership and their unwillingness to uh, accept the final resolution of the talks. But, but there were doubts about the impartiality of, the, of, of Norwegian engagement. For example, in the case of Myanmar, uh, the, 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 connect, the connection and the closeness of the Norwegian diplomats to the junta, to the military leadership and establishment in Myanmar led to the distrust among other engaged ethnic militant group in uh, Myanmar. So when it comes to the historical conclusion that Norway created peace, we should remember that thousands of Palestinians are still living under an apartheid regime in Gaza, in uh, West Bank, and thousands of uh, minorities, particularly Muslim minorities in Myanmar, are uh, homeless or deprived of their very basic human rights. Uh, so engagement of uh, Norway with these two major cases of international conflicts shows the perhaps uh, the lack of knowledge, unfortunately, when it comes to realities. This lack of knowledge also uh, is a case with Afghanistan. For example, in three major levels, states, NGOs, and uh, authorities, uh, Norway had been engaged with Afghanistan. For example, the Afghan influenced or the Norwegian influenced Afghan authorities were somehow engaged with the Taliban uh, following 2007, 2008. Uh, they were engaged with the, with the NGOs that were supported and receiving funds by the Norwegian government. And they were also engaged with the states, for example, like Qatar, like Germany, like the United States and Japan and Indonesia dealing with the issue of Afghanistan. On all these three levels, unfortunately, the whole investment of Norway has produced no tangible, uh, relatable uh, evidence of, uh, of moderation in terms of uh, the Taliban, on the side of the Taliban, and creating a platform and a, a pathway for inclusive peace in Afghanistan. For example, Norway, government provided support for this Center for Conflict Studies in Kabul that was run and led by Khalil Karzai, the former Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs, who hired four major Taliban representatives to work with the center as legal aid and legal representatives, somehow creating this, uh, this sway in dealing with the Taliban when it comes to Afghanistan context. But the question is, what are the result of that engagement, right? So the creation of the Doha office, which was a major theme of the Norwegian engagement with, with, with the Taliban, supported by the United States, supported by, 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 by Germany, created a vacuum of, uh, of, of, of international engagement, first of all, and second, domestic and internal partners of Afghanistan peace in that Doha process. The office of the Taliban in Qatar turned out to be the capital of the political capital of the Taliban for the next seven, eight years before the collapse, without providing enough uh, political maturity, enough political insight and expertise for creating a situation where all parties of the conflict, including the Afghan government, could have been part of a negotiation process. So when it comes to uh, assessing the whole engagement of NATO, uh, of Norway with, with the issue of Afghanistan peace, we should remember that this elitist sort of engagement, engaging with the dominant forces of violence of groups like the Taliban, right? These are not capable of providing the pathways for an inclusive peace. That is why not just the people of Afghanistan, but I think a majority of the Norwegian a democratic constituency is questioning not just the policy of engagement with the Taliban, but also about the transparency, about the results of this engagement. I believe that as we move forward, uh, first of all, uh, Norway needs to officially uh, clarify its position. Either it's a facilitator or still forced and influenced by major powers like the United States, while dealing with the Taliban. If Norwegian diplomacy, if Norwegian uh, peace initiative is on the side of values, then the values, including uh, human rights, women's rights, the rights to freedom and participation in any government has its, uh, its allies and its stakeholders in Afghanistan. Where are they? Are they represented in, in forums 
both uh, track one, the formal and track two, the informal sort of engagement with the people of Afghanistan or not. So my question and the whole uh, concern is that, that uh, moving toward the Taliban, ignoring the rest of the, the stakeholders of peace in Afghanistan will lead up to situation that Norway might somehow help to freeze the conflict in Afghanistan, right? But not solve the very foundational problem of uh, peace and stability in Afghanistan, which is the formation of an inclusive government, which is the issues of rights and, and, uh, and uh, responsibilities of citizens. And of course, the issue of the accountability of any inclusive government that comes after a transition period. So dealing with the peace, I think, needs uh, to be seen a very zoom out perspective, including all stakeholders, assessing critical, sustainable pathways for peace. And of course, making sure that we not just only report to the people of Afghanistan through channels of communications, through media, through civil society, but also to the constituents who Norway's government uh, is somehow representing, but keeping them in dark when it comes to issues of peace. Thank you very much. Very interesting insights. Thank you, Mr. Thoreau. Um, I'll turn to Ambassador Gafuzai, who is Ambassador of Afghanistan to Norway. Um, I would like to ask you, in light of the past experiences and in light of what was discussed um, until now today, uh, how should Norway approach the Taliban? Uh, do you think that the Taliban are capable of and interested in dialogue, negotiation and compromise? Or should Norway start thinking that there are no moderate Taliban as they thought initially in Doha and consequently invited them in light of their thinking last year uh, in Oslo? What do you think? Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, first, uh, I would like to provide some brief background on the history of outreach with the Taliban in answering that question. And hopefully I'll be given the eight minutes uh, uh, allocated. Uh, I hope to make some interesting points and important ones as well. I think we all know that the Taliban emerged in the summer of 1994. And into 1995, uh, when the Taliban reached the outskirts of the capital, Kabul, the government of the Islamic State of Afghanistan, which at the time was the internationally recognized government of Afghanistan, approached the Taliban for negotiations in order to reach a power sharing agreement. But the Taliban's position was clear. They demanded a complete surrender. Um, two years later, in 1997, um, after forming a, a new and inclusive government under a national unity agenda with contributions from professional Afghans, both inside Afghanistan as well as outside the country, my late father, Abdul Rahim Ghafurzai, as prime minister in the Islamic State of Afghanistan, called on the Taliban to join the new administration. Now, one of the question, questions of his, in history, Afghan history remains. I mean, had the tragic plane crash in August 97 not occurred, one never knows what could have been possible, but with the Taliban stance, there certainly weren't any guarantees for peace and reconciliation. In the following years, several meetings took place, including direct discussions between the conflicting sides in Tashkent in July 99, a year later in 2000 in Ashqabad, and at the time, the then UN Special Mission for Afghanistan, UNSPAN, facilitated those discussions under the leadership of the late Francesc Vendrell, who recently passed away and may God rest, rest his soul. Those talks did yield some progress, but unfortunately never turned into anything very serious. Of course, peace efforts continued during the post-2001 democratic period, and we saw former President Ahmed Karzai and many other senior political figures put forth several initiatives of peace and reconciliation. And as we know, most of the efforts at the time was led by, by the Afghan High Peace Council. And we remember the tragic incident in 2011 when the chairman of the council, Professor Albani, was killed by a Taliban messenger in a staged meeting that was, that was supposed to be about peace. And during this time, the international community, the United Nations, OIC, regional countries, even Western partners, including Norway, were engaged in some form or another. From 2010 on, we saw the international community make a new push for peace after declaring that a military solution to the conflict in Afghanistan would not be possible. In 2011, the Security Council 
decided to split the Taliban sanctions committee from the Al Qaeda sanctions regime in order to build confidence. And uh, I think it's important to note that for those that are unaware or who, or who may have forgotten, this was a major, a major concession by the Security Council, which is often forgotten or underestimated. That same year, several senior Taliban leaders were delisted from the Taliban sanctions committee and others were given exemptions from the travel ban in order to travel and to take part in peace talks. Additional efforts of which we're all aware up to negotiations between the Islamic Republic and the Taliban took place in, uh, from there on. So the main point here is it's very obvious that for close to three decades, three decades, that nationally and internationally, there has been no deficit in effort to reach some understanding or agreement with the Taliban. And in this period of time, it's, it's important to note that very difficult, very difficult decisions were made by the people and the international community as well. But as we've seen the Taliban's actions before and after the takeover have thus far shown that they have not been serious about a settlement and insisted on unilateral rule, irrespective of the consequences for the people. Um, in the past 18 months, the international community has engaged with the Taliban, mainly on matters of human rights, and emergency humanitarian economic assistance for the people. And as we know, those issues were part of the discussions that were held in Oslo between Afghan civil society and the Taliban. Now, the Norwegian government did state before, during, and after the visit, including at the UN Security Council, that the Oslo meeting aimed to influence the Taliban's actions towards the demands of the people, and that it sh should in no way be seen as giving any degree of recognition. Um, regarding the roadmap, uh, it's quite clear that the roadmap that was given to the Taliban by civil society did provide some pathway, which could have been useful if respected, if respected, and if implemented by the Taliban. But unfortunately, unfortunately, we saw days, if not uh, weeks, if not days after the visit. And before the visit, if I can just talk about the, the roadmap quickly, the elements, we've all seen the text, it was about the start of a political process for a settlement. It was about adopting a constitution for political transition, convening a lawyer jirga to form a transitional government, preparations for elections as soon as possible, and a revised constitution to ensure that the rights of all citizens would be ensured without any discrimination. But unfortunately, we saw just days and weeks after the visit that the Taliban issued another decree banning women, women banning girls from attending school beyond the sixth grade. And then after that, there was another decree that was issued. I mean, I can say that this was not a surprise to the people of Afghanistan, but it was a disappointment to the international community. So time and again, the Taliban have misused international dialogue and engagement for political gain. Second, I think it's also important to note and not forget that the, the Norway has been engaged with the Taliban, but not just with the Taliban. Norway has been one of the supporters of the development of Afghan civil society and women's empowerment prior to the takeover. It has also supported the inclusion and also the very active participation of Afghan women in the negotiations between the Islamic Republic and the Taliban in Doha. Norway has also been in contact with non-Taliban figures, including civil society, but not just civil society. As pen holder in the Security Council, Norway did give a platform to civil society, to activists, to speak about the tragedy that has befallen the Afghan people and the way in which the rights, and the honor, and the dignity of Afghans have been severely violated in the past 16 months. But as the struggle for peace continues, I think it's important for the international community, including Norway, to engage closer with the very committed, responsible political figures that have a genuine desire in a peaceful, united, and democratic Afghanistan. And I think this really should be inspired by the, by the heroism of Afghan women and other citizens who are defending their rights and national values in a very difficult situation. Finally, what can and should be done? I think despite the Taliban's reluctance, it's important that the, that the push for peace should not only continue, but from here on, it should be pursued as a matter of priority. I believe that at, a lack of a unified position by the international community so far uh, for a serious political process may have given the Taliban the impression that countries and organizations are only interested on human rights and the humanitarian situation. And I think it's also very obvious that the United Nations has a very important role, but not just a role, but also, 
a responsibility to help begin such a process. And as we know, engaging political stakeholders for inclusive governance is one of the three very core issues in UNAMA's mandate, which was, by the way, facilitated by Norway and adopted by the Council in March. We must also recognize that the crisis in Afghanistan primarily is a political one, is a political one. And therefore, without a, polit without a political solution, it's very clear that the cycle of instability, suffering and uncertainty for the people will unfortunately continue. Uh, last and final point, the international community should now begin a very structured dialogue with democratic political forces from across social segments and ethnic groups in order to mobilize and identify which core issues will need attention in the context of a future administration that is inclusive, that has national and international legitimacy, and which ultimately guarantees the political stability that Afghanistan needs. And I think that outreach should include women and youth groups, political parties, independent figures, intellectuals in the diaspora abroad, and all Afghans should be given the opportunity to play their role. Now, should there still be no visible change in the Taliban's approach, I think new measures should be taken into consideration to influence the Taliban's decision-making to reach an agreement with the people of Afghanistan. And as a final, final point, I want to state that the Afghan people are very able, are very capable, and very ready to start a new chapter in the country's history with or without the Taliban. And our people at this stage expect the international community to stand by them and to work even closer from here on in order to restore stability. And I look forward to taking questions from you. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador Rafuzai. Um, I'd like to go to Ms. Um, Dr. Vida Mehran um, as a, and ask her, like, what advice should be given to international actors as a way forward um, for um, intra-Afghan dialogue uh, or peace negotiations? Um, if you could elaborate on that. Thank you. So um, a lot of the points that I had actually uh, noted down were already said by uh, very eloquent speakers that I would probably highlight some of them, and particularly the remarks that Ambassador Rafuri made uh, in terms of engagement with uh, um, various uh, communities across the board and empowering some of these uh, forces, democratic forces, both inside and outside Afghanistan is uh, extremely important at this point. And we all understand or aware of the fact that um, reaching inside Afghanistan um, is uh, difficult, is challenging, and empowering groups there would be challenging. Dialogue with uh, such communities is challenging for uh, uh, for the international community, for various uh, countries in general and organizations, but nonetheless, uh, that has to be done. We cannot leave the people of Afghanistan, those inside Afghanistan, particularly women's groups, partic particularly um, when it comes to uh, uh, to uh, uh, ethnic my ethnic uh, people from ethnic different ethnic backgrounds who have been oppressed recently in the last sixteen months by the Taliban. Let's not forget that. The Taliban's ruling in Afghanistan in the past 16 months have not just been oppressive towards women, they have been extremely oppressive towards um, other ethnic communities in Afghanistan and religious communities in Afghanistan. And we have all known about incidents happening uh, um, in, in Afghanistan against Hazara people, Shia communities, she has our Hazara and Shia communities in the country. Um, they are living in fear in Afghanistan. So um, we, as I said, there should be engagement, there should be uh, uh, empowering of those groups inside Afghanistan. And a lot of, um, as well, then that's one side of engagement. And another side of it is also engagement with uh, um, the Afghan diaspora. Thousands and thousands of Afghans have left the country and they're waiting counting the days to return back to their home country. We, we all want to be able to go back to Afghanistan and contribute to uh, the future of the country. And um, realizing the importance of those forces is extremely uh, important as well, that these groups, um, they, they are, uh, they used to be the, major contributors to building the building Afghanistan, contributing to the social political life in the country. And the, 
essentially they were the social capital of the country and making sure that that social capital has a way of engaging with the country is extremely important and they should be able to engage with the country and be part of this peace process and the peace process as other um, panelists have mentioned um, uh, it is not just about engaging with the Taliban at the top level. It has, we have all seen that engagement at the top level, at the top level, a top down process has not been successful. Mr. Frouk mentioned an important remark saying that what were the results of prior engagement? We know what the results were Taliban's government in Afghanistan abject poverty, oppression of women and ethnic minorities in the country, religious communities and uh, ethnic communities, non-Pashtun ethnic communities in the country, and even our Pashtun communities under oppressive uh, regime of the Taliban. So that approach of a top-down approach that it was taken and the whole buy-in at the local level was not established, it was not focused on, that approach has to be changed. Unless that approach is not changed, any further engagement taking the same, in the same manner and in the same way will not be successful. And realizing and understanding, as uh, Professor ID mentioned as well, the local dynamics, and knowledge of the country and what led to this failure and what should be done to avoid further failures is extremely important. It was mentioned what promises the Taliban made. The Taliban made a number of provinces, the promises, excuse me, that I won't go through them because they were just mentioned by Ambassador Khafuri right now. They did not deliver on any of these, those promises. Now, the question is why? Were they able to deliver on them? Was that a political will, a conscious decision on the part of the Taliban to make a promise and then forget about it? Or did they actually make any effort to deliver those promises? And what were the challenges? What are the internal, and what type of promises did we expect from the Taliban to deliver? And for example, one one example, simple example that uh, uh, during the peace talks with the peace agreement, well, I don't call it peace agreement, the troops withdrawal agreement with the Taliban and the US uh, that it was signed, that expectation was and the promise made that the uh, Taliban will sever ties with Al Qaeda. We just saw only a few months back that Al Zawahi was killed in Afghanistan. Was it wishful thinking? that such expectations were made of the Taliban. And in the future, as we move on to more dialogue engagement with the Taliban, how can we revise those notions and learn also from those lessons as we move forward? That is extremely important again. We should realize and have the knowledge, going back to the point of having the knowledge and realistic knowledge of the situation in Afghanistan, that if we make a promise and expect the Taliban to make a promise, come to the negotiations table and agreement, will they deliver on it? Are we being realistic? And is the Taliban actually being honest, making those promises? So these are important points that they ha we have to think about and account for when we move on uh, to negotiations with the Taliban and also, the other side of it, which was also uh, briefly mentioned by other panelists, and I, uh, and I think it's extremely important as well, is that when we talk about um, engagement with the Taliban, it's, it's also extremely important to make sure that the type of message we sent to the people of Afghanistan through this engagement. Because as it was mentioned by another panelist earlier, when Taliban meets with any of the uh, representatives and diplomats from any other country, the, the interpretation of that event is by women in Afghanistan. Are we being forgotten here that we see how much of, of how an, an oppressive regime the Taliban is, but nonetheless, we see them sitting down around the table with diplo diplomats from Western countries, for example. 
is the right of women forgotten here? So the message through these diplomat diplomatic relations or peace uh, diplomacy to the Taliban, the message that it gives to the Afghan public and in general is extremely important as well. That at the same time that the Taliban are being um, encouraged to engage in a dialogue and there are efforts to engage with them on more uh, uh, substantial, uh, at the substantial levels that we also make sure that the tragedy that is happening in Afghanistan in terms of women's rights, in terms of the rights of um, religious and ethnic groups in Afghanistan is not forgotten and we do not send a message to the people of Afghanistan that um, they are uh, the second priority here because a lot of the time that is the impression that we get um, from inside Afghanistan and um, this engagement also without recognition is recognition of the Taliban has to be handled much more uh, seriously because the Taliban and much more sensitively because the Taliban uh, inside Afghanistan, they build this narrative of how they talk to the outside world and the messages they send out, they use this opportunity to portray themselves as a legit as the legitimate and acceptable government of Afghanistan by the international community. And they built their own political rhetoric on that, which is, again, it has to be, as I mentioned, handled very sensitively and carefully, not to contribute to the Taliban's cause of establishing their narrative of legitimacy around, uh, around any engagement with the international community. Thank, Thank you so you. much, Dr. Ida Mehran. Thank you for all the very comprehensive insights. And uh, thank you, everyone. Um, I'll just go briefly on what uh, topics were discussed. Uh, uh, we started with talking about the Norway as penholder of Afghanistan and then the criteria for um, becoming a mediator in peace process. And as we also, um, Dr. Sarabi assessed the role of Norway um, uh, in the peace process and Norway's peace diplomacy. And then we discussed the um, transparency, impartiality, and credibilities of Norway's efforts and its uh, uh, engagement with the Taliban. And then we also discussed uh, how Norway's approach to the Taliban should be or um, are Taliban capable of, uh, you know, engaging into dialogue? And then, um, as Dr. Rida Mehran uh, posed lots of very important questions uh, about the, not to forget the women of Afghanistan, not to not to ignore the uh, gender persecution, not to ignore the persecution of ethnic groups and religious groups in Afghanistan. But uh, before going to questions or getting questions from the audiences, I just have one question from uh, Mr. Uh, Nasir Ahmad Fayek because um, we had to interrupt him due to the uh, time. I have one question from you, and that's the... You are at the UN and uh, you are in, you know, um, in, in the picture of everything going on as Norway, Norway is the pen holder of Afghanistan. How, to what extent Norway has contributed in bringing allies together to, uh, to build on an accountability mechanism against the Taliban's uh, uh, violation of human rights in Afghanistan? This is one issue or on another one. And how much Norway has contributed to get the gender apartheid going on in Afghanistan recognized by the UN, or at least gather some allies to work on it, or pressure the international community or, or pressure the other members of the UN Security Council uh, and alert them about the crimes against humanity and war crimes in some uh, some some instances happening in Afghanistan. If you could reflect on it very briefly, Mr. Fayek, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, about the uh, Norway, just a, as a clarity, uh, Norway is no longer the uh, pen holder. Uh, Japan and UAE are now the pen holder of Afghanistan file at the UN for the next uh, uh, two years. 
And uh, Norway, uh, in terms of pen holder, pen holder has uh, some certain uh, roles and responsibilities at the Security Council uh, when it comes to taking charges uh, and files of each uh, uh, country. Uh, so it's not fully up to the uh, pen holder to do something very tangible. It's not easy, particularly about the situation in Afghanistan. A pen holder is also supposed to be impartial and trying to, to facilitate among the members of the council uh, the issue that, that they are tackling. And, and then there is a national position of a pen holder or a national position of a member of the Security Council. Then it comes to the Norway that we can talk about it. And as I mentioned, that Norway has tried its best. And, and of course, we should not forget that Norway has its own priorities. And as I mentioned, they, each member state, when it comes with, when, when they become member of Security Council, they try to, before that, uh, uh, lobby and announce that what we would like to do and what, uh, what will be our priorities. And no, no country wants to, to discredit its reputation among the international partners. And I'm sure that uh, I don't want to speak on behalf of Norway. And I hope that there was someone from Norway, uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs could participate in this discussion to speak on their behalf. But I can tell about the other members from the perspective of international level and at the UN. So each country tries to, to, to leave a good legacy at the council and also a good footprint and, and when it becomes the member of security council. Mm -hmm. They did their best, they did issued, they tried to engage with Afghan uh, civil society, invited uh, uh, Afghan speakers, civil society speakers, they issued uh, statements, they tried their best, but sometimes you know that at the, in, in the security council, there are some countries that they are advocating for the Taliban, even though they do not recognize them. And it's very difficult. And uh, a pen holder tries its best to be impartial while also trying to, to support and advocate uh, the values, democratic values and, and human rights and international uh, uh, um, uh, principles. So uh, Norway, I think did it its best, but uh, it, the, it's very complex. As I mentioned, the engagement. Engagement, when we talk about engagement, it first comes to engagement of international community with Taliban which is now very clear and there is a, a, a consensus that international community and UN will engage with Taliban. This is only for the benefit of Afghanistan people, only to help the people of Afghanistan who are suffering from humanitarian situation and to try to uh, convey the message of international community to, to, uh, to have a dialogue with Taliban, but it does not mean recognition at all. And then second, uh, it comes to engagement with the people of Afghanistan. This is where we all Afghans have our high expectations from international community that was very eloquently elaborated by the panelists that Afghan people want transparency, credibility, and they want uh, that whatever is uh, um, decided, they should be involved, they should be uh, on the table, and there should be no uh, uh, secret uh, deals or agreements behind the scene. So this is, uh, uh, this is uh, how I can see and I'm, I'm sure that um, the engagement is now very clear. And I hope that at international community, I agree with the point that was made that the uh, Taliban always try to misuse from the engagement and they try to show that the international community is normalizing their relations and they are going toward recognition, which is not true. Thank, Thank you so much, Mr. Faik. Um, now we're going to open the floor for the audience. Let's get some questions from them. There is a question. Um, I'm afraid it's again uh, from Mr. Faik. Uh, I'd like to, there's a person called Jamil Shirzad. He says that as the well, I'd like to ask Mr. Faik, is there any way to weigh up the knowledge that Norway establishments have about the Taliban mindset ideology? and the structure of internal Taliban educational institutions that shapes the insight towards others were Norway's only intended to take the powerful side and mediate accordingly without considering the devastating outcomes on Afghanistan people. So overall, he's asking if Norway is only interested to take powerful side and mediate without considering the outcomes on the people of Afghanistan. Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Fayek, if you could be very brief, because I would like to um, give the floor to other speakers as well for other for their remarks and if they have any uh, reflections. 
Thank you. Okay, I hope that this should be answered by uh, this question should be asked from a Norwegian <laughs> MFA colleague, or maybe um, it's Professor Eide can answer that. But you I'm can, sure you that can divide the answers. Uh, you can you can uh, say your okay. remarks, and then I'll go to. Yeah. But uh, for uh, but but we can everybody agrees. Let's let's uh, first think about this that uh, at the international level, at the UN diplomacy and dialogue is the cornerstone. And why the UN was established is through, it's because of, uh, of very clear objectives through diplomacy and negotiation. So for any country who is trying to engage with Taliban or any peace diplomacy or conflict resolution, their main objective is that they want to do something good. They want to do something that it should be as a, as a legacy for them. But for Norway is also the same. But let's not forget the realities on the ground. When you are faced with a group that, as Ambassador Afuza mentioned about the background, it has been going on for a long time. But on the other hand, there is the uh, 40 million people, they are suffering. An international community has a responsibility to act based on the principles, based on the charter, union charter. And uh, they, they do their best, uh, but also there is a question of ownership. Ownership is always uh, the, the de facto authorities. They announce that we are Afghans, we are the de facto authority, and we, nobody, international community should not interfere in our internal affairs. And they try to link these, their, their un Islamic behavior to, to culture and to Islam, which is not true. And this is a, a way that they have found, and this narrative is now unfortunately being uh, developed uh, uh, by some countries in the region as well, which is not true. Afghanistan, their Taliban's behavior is not, uh, not uh, uh, representing Afghanis, Afghan people's culture. And, uh, and the, the fact is about the ownership. And they, some countries support the Afghan ownership, even though they, they, rec they don't recognize Taliban as a legitimate government, but uh, they, some facilitators, they have, to, uh, they have to engage with de facto authorities as Afghans because they are, they are, um, they are providing uh, security or access to these people and, and they need to engage with them. Thank you, uh, Ms. Elizabeth. Either before you start, uh, can I ask the um, participants if they have any questions, please type them in the Q&A. Uh, we are happy to get questions from you. Um, Professor Ida, please go ahead. Thank you so much. You can call me Elizabeth safely. <laughs> uh, first, um, I'd like to say that Norway has a complex uh, face towards the world. One face is what has been called, at least at home, a uh, humanitarian superpower. And that is not totally unrelated to the petrodollars that was mentioned in the first title, I have to say. I mean, we have the uh, legacy of being able to support much humanitarian efforts across the world due to our own. Uh, uh, luck in geologically speaking. Uh, secondly, we are also uh, wrecking uh, the nation, Norway, and the, the stakeholders are uh, promoting themselves as peacemongers with the, and without success, I would say both. And I would like to just reflect a little bit upon what that can mean. And it's very short, but give me uh, some patience here. I think the temptations of peace negotiations are the following. First, uh, to blame the locals if you fail, and to take credit yourself if you success if you succeed. So I mean that, that's one thing. And third, uh, you can also exaggerate your own role. I mean, in Guatemala, Mexico was at least as important, if not more important, than Norway in solving the problems there. But that was undercommunicated by the Norwegian media, for example, which is kind of a local lo logical media approach. You may recognize that in many countries. And uh, third. Uh, I'd like to also uh, uh, say that you can undercommunicate the negative consequences of a deal, as has possibly been done, for example, Israel, Palestine, but also other places. On the other hand, I mean, the humanitarian efforts are sort of detached, but also hand in hand with these efforts. So it's a, that's what I mean with complexity. Uh, I'd like to say one word about women. Uh, I'm very delighted to see Habiba Surabi here as I visited her in the governor's palace in Bamiyan uh, 11 years ago soon, or at least uh, 10 years ago. And also I think once in a party, a uh, wedding party in Kabul, if I'm not mistaken. So it's a pleasure to see you here. And uh, I also almost cried when I saw you uh, embracing our Ministry of Foreign Affairs after the one of the Taliban decrees about uh, banning women university students. As it happens also in Norway, 
some of the most prominent, two of the most prominent female activists came to Norway as recognized refugees. But they were, by this peculiar district policy that we have for refugees, placed in a very remote places, very far from Oslo, where they could have been at, at least weekly or daily consultancies with the government about Afghanistan policy, which is their expertise. Uh, both have now left Norway. This is uh, something for your reference. Last but not least, I'd say one word about journalism, since I'm a journalism professor, in case you didn't know that. Um, we have done a report on the Afghan media development the three first months after Taliban took power at last, uh, oh, in 2021. And this report is available. I will send you all the uh, link after this. And what we concluded there was that there is uh, there are so many ways in which journalism is now curbed and journalists are marginalized. Uh, we even hear about journalists begging on the streets. But on the other hand, those who still try to do some decent reporting, albeit all these restrictions, they should earn our respect because the people, the majority of Afghans are still in Afghanistan and they deserve to have some information, although it's censored, although it's difficult, at times very difficult, a journalist write to me from inside. But I think we also need to say about empower, empowerment is also about having the right to know and what journalists can still try to do from exile, but also from inside the country, feeding the exile media. Thank you, thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, there's another question and uh, it's not directed to anyone specific, so anyone who would feel uh, comfortable, they can answer it. From Shoaib Rahim, uh, seeing Norwegian engagement in Doha firsthand, I would like to ask the level of independence the panelists think the Norwegians actually have in their engagement with the Taliban versus their independence on the US for direction. I can see that Mr. Farouk Tabish has raised his hand. Please go ahead, Mr. Tabish. Just very briefly, it's a very uh, important question. Uh, I have the experience of working with one of the European uh, embassies back in Kabul while I, was, while I was in Afghanistan, I don't want to name it, but I have seen very firsthand that most of these European peace-loving, democratic, value-driven embassies back in Kabul, they were highly influenced by the thinking and by the influence of the United States as major power involved in a Pakistan conflict. So, I mean, uh, it's a tough to say that there was no intention of being independent from the side of the Norway. Maybe some of the Norwegian diplomats, their institutions were trying their best to be as partial as uh, possible. But, but the limitation they faced vis-a-vis -vis the United States power and influence was huge. That is why that uh, over almost 12 years of uh, engagement with the Taliban, directly, indirectly, formally, informally, uh, the Norwegian engagement with the Taliban provided no tangible outcome not just for the peace, but also for uh, even, even the opportunity cost of engaging with the Taliban is huge for the Norway. I mean, uh, there should be independent uh, inquiry and questions about how effective what, what, what the whole engagement with the Taliban were when it comes to the end the state of the current situation in Afghanistan. So I, I think that question uh, needs to be understood not just vis-a-vis -vis Afghanistan, or the independence and impartiality of uh, Norway, but rather vis-a-vis uh, -vis the power of the United States. Unfortunately, for uh, most of the people of Afghanistan, it's a moment of rec reckoning. And we understand that, uh, unfortunately, it's still that, that patronizing colonial knowledge of peacemaking, of dealing with communities and dealing with, with situation still exists. And for Norway to become a credible partner of Afghan peace process, uh, the establishment, the intellectuals, the journalists needs to come out of that bubble of being uh, lenient to the United States and becoming more close to the realities of Afghanistan, not just politically, historically, ethnically, and whatever form of complexity and sophistication that Afghanistan society presents as a very complex human society and after almost four and a half decades of war. Thank you so much. I can see that Ms. Habiba Sarabi has also raised her hand. If you have any remarks, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Uh, first, I want to uh, uh, just add to the point uh, uh, Professor Elizabeth mentioned about some uh, 
I mean, professional or the people that they were involved with the, uh, the uh, politic in Afghanistan, but they are isolated in Norway. Still, there are some people, for example, Dr. Amina Hani uh, was one of the uh, member of negotiation team, and he is very knowledgeable person, and the same Shagul Rezaei, she was the uh, MP in Afghanistan and very knowledgeable uh, woman, but both of them, they are in a very remote area and uh, for, they are forgotten uh, and they could be a kind of uh, um, uh, advisor for policymaker in Norway. Coming to the question of uh, Mr. Shwaib Rahim that uh, uh, mentioned, uh, he, uh, he is a good friend, he was uh, with the Ministry of Peace and he knows better that everyone knows that uh, nor uh, Norway, neither uh, Qatar, uh, none of them, they were impartial. They were under the influence of, of U.S. Anything that, any decision, any uh, anything could be, uh, I mean, talk with the U.S. and American, they were following that. Uh, and that's why uh, even uh, with the Qataris authority, we were very clearly recognized that uh, they, uh, they were not impartial and they were taking sides uh, uh, for Taliban, Taliban were getting support, financial support and moral support by Qatari's authority and Norway also uh, uh, didn't uh, take the, this uh, impartiality with this uh, um, uh, negotiation process. Thank you so much. Uh, I think before going to Mr. Ghafurzai, Mr. Shwaib Rahim is here and uh, if, if he can, could he maybe have his insights because he was the advisor at the Peace Council. Can you hear me, Mr. Schreiber? I, um, I need to, I, need, I don't know if he can, if he can speak right now. But, oh, he has to leave, uh, he cannot, okay. Ms. Bida Mehran says that she had to leave. She has an important appointment. Thank you so much for being here. If you have any, any uh, remarks, any final reflections or remarks, please go ahead before you leave, Ms. Mehran. And then we'll go back to other panelists for their uh, remarks. Sorry, for a second, I lost the button for unmuting myself. Um, apologies, I have an important appointment that I have to attend and I apologize for leaving this very interesting discussion earlier than I, I would have loved to stay longer. Um, the one thing that I would like to highlight um, in continuation of the discussions that have been made going forward with any type of negotiations and um, with the Taliban and dialogue with the Taliban, I would, I would I would hate to see that the rights of women are sidelined or the discussion of the oppression of women in Afghanistan takes the second stage in any talks, any engagement with the Taliban and the international community, the diplomatic community, the um, anybody engaging with the Taliban from outside, of, obviously from the outside world has to bear that in mind any time they sit around the table with the Taliban they shall not forget the Afghan women and what people of minorities background with ethnic minorities, religious uh, people from other religious communities that have been oppressed. So it's extremely important to keep that in mind. To the extent that I would highly recommend, and it's important that anytime there is an engagement with the Taliban, there should be discussions with women's groups and activists in Afghanistan, inside Afghanistan, if that's not possible, at, at least outside Afghanistan, those communities, Afghan communities outside, to highlight and give a balanced picture of that engagement to the public in Afghanistan and to the, in general, to the world, because if, the world sees people and citizens of any other country see that there are diplomats, politicians sitting down, sitting down with the Taliban talking. There is always a question of why. And have we forgotten about women of Afghanistan? That's extremely, as an Afghan woman myself, have, having experienced the Taliban the first time around, they were in power. That is an extremely important message that has to be sent out and there should be, we have to 
be mindful of that when engaging with the Taliban at this point, that the women of Afghanistan particularly have should not be forgotten. Thank you so much. There is a question for uh, Ambassador Ghafurzayan here. Um, I'll read it out for you. Um, as the ambassador of Afghanistan in Oslo, why are you silent about what happens in Afghanistan? What do you do in Oslo? Some ambassadors like Mr. Fayek play an active role in the situation, but you are silent. And he's asking um, that is your silence caused by the Norwegian government's interaction with the Taliban? Uh, Mr. Ambassador, if you would like to reflect on that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, to be honest, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, a bit, not just a bit surprised, but quite surprised in that question, because I think uh, one of the embassies that have been extremely vocal, if not not just the vocal, but spearheading efforts in defense of national values of the people of Afghanistan, Afghan history, culture, identity, and uh, trying to find solution for to get beyond this very difficult stage. Uh, I think I can say not just myself, but the entire team at the Afghan embassy can take a lot of honor and pride in defending the interests of the people of Afghanistan. And um, I'm also pleased to say that we have a very active uh, social media network and all the statements, comments, interventions um, are, are made public on, on our social media. So I would, I would kindly ask my uh, good friend and compatriots to, to visit our website and Twitter account. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you for, for the very comprehensive answer. Um, we have Mr. Shoaib Rahim here. Um, would you like to uh, uh, just short, briefly state your comments and remarks, Mr. Rahim, and thank you for being here. Just before you start, uh, any other participants, if they would like, if they would like to, to speak, uh, just they, raise their hands and we will give them access to the mic. Thank you very much. Am I audible? Yes. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the great intervention by the panelists. I really enjoyed the discussion so far. Um, I just want to expand a little bit on the comment and the question that I presented, um, being that I was also a part of the uh, general delegation uh, in Doha, working closely with many of the special representatives, um, uh, including the Norwegian special representatives. Um, and um, there, were, there are a few dynamics touching, I think, which um, are important to note given our conversation. The first dynamic is the, is the level of distrust that the uh, palace and uh, Ashraf Ghani had with the Norwegian government at the time with regards to the peace process. Now, where this distrust came from could be assessed and analyzed from various perspectives, but essentially, uh, my observation in Doha was that uh, although Norwegian policy of mediation, facilitation, and various conflicts was consistent and continues to be consistent, um, the concern was from the republic side or from the palace side, not to generalize, um, that the Norwegians essentially played as uh, an extension of um, U.S. options. Um, and there was a bit of rivalry going on among the uh, uh, technical uh, countries which pr provided technical support to the process, the five countries which uh, one of the panelists alluded to in, in, in uh, their speech earlier in the talk. Um, so that was one observation, the discomfort. The second was um, how I think Norway continued to um, uh, unfortunately continue to fail at attracting the Taliban negotiators to any meaningful engagement beyond the casual track two, which were not binding. Um, and unfortunately, the, the effectiveness of uh, the role that uh, the general, the five nations, particularly Norway had in Doha, was pretty, was pretty apparent. And by the end, um, I think that th that role deteriorated. So I just wanted to share uh, just a, a bit of information and also uh, present this question because um, in my observation, well, naturally, when the U.S. sets policy at many countries, particularly in Europe, at least try not to clash with that policy um, uh, for obvious reasons. 
Um, but I think the level of autonomy in dictating the direction that the Norwegian government would engage with the Taliban is still in question. How much independence and how much autonomy uh, uh, exists, uh, that, is, that is a question for me uh, still. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rahim. Um, just before I go to Mr. Five for the remarks, there is one question. We we have uh, we are limited with time. I think we've only we're, we're left with uh, seven or eight minutes maximum, um, so that we could conclude. I'll ask the last question posed by the audience, and uh, then there is one question which is already answered by Elizabeth. Thank you so much. Uh, she has written to her to Mohtar Wafoyi, and. Um, you can elaborate more like within a one or two minutes later before the question that I'm going to read out from Anna Chernova. Should humanitarian development and peace building efforts continue to operate if organizations are forced to operate with male only staff? Should humanitarian efforts continue as life saving without women staff? And if so, for how long? How to avoid such a compromise becoming a dangerous new norm? for aid operations. Um, uh, anyone who would like to go, take, I mean, hands are raised, I don't know whom should I, the question has not been asked from a specific person. I'd like to um, ask Mr. Fayek if he wants to go ahead. Thank you. I uh, first- Very briefly, I, please, yeah. Okay, we'll answer this. I, I agree with you that uh, um, there are concerns about the, uh, the, the female workers uh, at the uh, uh, NGOs. So the decision that by taken by the Taliban banned uh, women working in NGOs. So let's make it clear that uh, they took this decision and also this um, the ban of women uh, continuing their education. These two things are very deliberate and very tactical because uh, uh, they, they know that Usually during the winter, there is in Afghanistan, there is a winter recess in education, and they wanted to minimize all the international pressure to two issues, education and allowing women, uh, uh, female workers in NGOs. So uh, now we can see that everybody, all international community is engaged with the Taliban to reverse these two decisions. But there are many other issues that they are uh, still unanswered by the Taliban. So this is very deliberate and I'm sure that this will, they will reverse this decision. It will be reversed and, and we will, um, we can see that. Uh, but uh, what about the women who were working in the government? What about the women who were working in other independent uh, or other institutions? We don't know about their situation because still they are at home, they are banned. And, uh, uh, and this is concerning. And, and of course we should focus when we are uh, focusing on women participation in Afghanistan, it should be in all areas, social, humanitarian, social, economic, uh, cultural, and political uh, sectors. And um, uh, in terms of one of the issues about the transparency and clarity, which I always, um, asked by people of Afghanistan in, in my engagement is uh, inter engagement and participation of uh, engagement with civil society and representatives. And I don't want to name diaspora because diaspora is a bit sensitive, but I just want to say those Afghans that they were forced to leave their country and now they are living abroad uh, is of course very key. And people ask that when there is engagement, there should be transparency. And so unfortunately, some of these countries, they try to invite and engage with, based on their personal contacts with some people that they knew back in Kabul for a long time and always provide them their platforms. We uh, Afghan people are always asking me that why we are not, there are many capable Afghan uh, diaspora or Afghan elite or Afghan professionals, Afghans that they, they are representing Afghan women, Afghan uh, people, youth, but nobody provides them with platform. So this is one of the issues that we would like to raise that when engagement, when uh, international community is engaging with, uh, with civil society, with diaspora, they have to take this into consideration. And, and this is very important. 
Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fire. Uh, there is this last question. I'm sorry, we, we, we're running out of time and I'll have to ask. This is the last question, which is posed to a diplomat, which I assume should be Mr. Rafuzai's turn. Um, Mr. Lutfullah Lutfi has asked the alternative to the current engagement policy could be a complete diplomatic isolation of the Taliban. Do you support that approach? If not, do you believe in possibility of achieving a reform Taliban as a result of continued engagement? Do we need the conditions of engagement to change or the whole thing should stop? Uh, Mr. Gafurza, just very briefly, after your remarks, I'll come to Mr. Tabish, Elizabeth and Dr. Sarabi for their final remarks. And then we'll close the session. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Very interesting and very important question. But before coming to that question, I want to make a general point, which is important. I mean, there has been a lot of talk about what can or cannot one specific country do with regard to peace and reconciliation and mediation. I think the, the broader factor is international consensus for peace in Afghanistan. If we don't have the right international environment of consensus, whereby members of the permanent, permanent members of the Security Council have achieved consensus for a significant change or improvement in the situa situation, no any individual or other smaller group effort, effort will be able to bring about substantial change. I think we should uh, look clearly into the experience of the 2001 Afghanistan. The Security Council quickly adopted three important resolutions which laid the foundation for a new chapter in Afghanistan's history. So in that regard, I think it's very important for the UN and the UN to play to have a more proactive role in generating international consensus. But when we talk about international consensus, specifically consensus among the permanent five in the UN Security Council. I think if we have that in place, a lot of other parallel initiatives will become much easier in terms of um, moving forward. Um, but on that, I think that's a very important point. And within international consensus, we should never forget that the conflict and crisis of Afghanistan has primarily been driven um, by regional dynamics. And we also need a regional consensus. And there again, I think the UN is best positioned to, to um, try to bring about that regional consensus as well. Um, with regard to dialogue and engagement with the Taliban, I was very clear in my, in my remarks that um, not just about dialogue over the past 15 months, but dialogue over the past 27 years. Outreach after outreach after outreach, compromise after compromise and compromise and getting nothing in return. But at the same time, I think it's important that the doors of negotiation should always be kept open in any conflict environment, in any conflict setting, including the situation in Afghanistan now. Um, I think pressure can be applied and should be applied on the Taliban, and they should also be given a specific time frame collectively by the international community to deliver on all the core demands of the Afghan people, but also the core same core demands that are shared, but shared by the international community. And if that's not met, I think new, new, new measures should be considered. Thank you so much. Just final remarks, Dr. Sarabi, in one minute, please. Okay, thank you, Mr. John. I'll be very brief. Um, so I wanted to uh, um, um, elaborate and that uh, how there will be a kind of um, trust building and confidence between the, uh, um, the Taliban, Norway, the people of Afghanistan, especially how uh, they can trust in Norway. If the Norway can, the policy of Norway uh, can be very transparent and uh, uh, Norway should uh, make a clear uh, position and also to be transparent on the people. So in this case, people uh, will trust uh, Norway for, uh, for its en engagement for the peace process. And I'm echoing with uh, Mr. Farouk that he mentioned, uh, Norway can uh, freeze the conflict, uh, conflict, but not making any decision for the future of Afghanistan. This is the people of Afghanistan to make decision that which type of government they want to have it in the future. So always the history showed us uh, within this uh, 50 years that the ready-made dress will not, uh, um, I mean, uh, effect will not be comfortable for the people of Afghanistan, Afghanistan. And people of Afghanistan should make decision that what to do and which type of government they want to uh, have it in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Tabish, floor is yours. Very briefly. Oh, oh, very briefly. <clears throat> I want to build on uh, the points Ambassador Gafurze made. I believe uh, UN is not a charity organization. Yes, the charity organization, the charity work of the UN is very vital and crucial in making sure that we are not facing a famine 
in Afghanistan where people are having very some basic uh, services. Uh, the main uh, role of the UN needs to be based on its charter, <clears throat> creating the international support, creating a conducive diplomacy atmosphere where uh, uh, diplomacy is possible, where engagement is possible, where participation of all political forces, not just internally, regionally, and globally is possible. In this mission, unfortunately, the UN engagement has been failed, uh, has failed, uh, and uh, the people of Afghanistan needs to see it just beyond what, what the current default mood of the UN is providing, I don't know, $40 million, $50 million, whatever. This negotiation needs to be tangible. On the question of engagement, I have asked these questions in many panels and interviews that I have had with, with many people, with many different institutions. It's not just rhetorical questions. What if, for example, we wake up and Boko Haram take over Nigerian government? What if we wake up the next day and Ashabab takes over the, uh, the Sudanese government, Somalia's government? These, these issues of dealing with terrorist organization, it's not just about political labeling of the Taliban. Taliban or an insurgent terrorist organization. They have a track record history of uh, using violence and terror against people of Afghanistan, against international citizens, international aid agencies, and currently involved in multi-dimensional terror activities in the region and across the globe. So the international community has a moral duty to, um, to, to ask this question. What if, for example, another terror organization takes over in another country? When it comes to Afghanistan, yes, we have lost a fight to the Taliban, but the battle is still going on. The fight is still going on. We have to remain uh, uh, consistent with the values that we tell our citizens in the, in the democratic world, and, and we pretend to defend across the world. So if this discrepancy, if this duality of uh, selectivism is not removed from dealing with Afghanistan, I think the people of Afghanistan will become more uh, suspicious of the efforts of the international community with dealing with the Taliban. Thank you so much. Um, Elizabeth, final remarks. Thank you. Very fun, and thank you for excellent moderation also. I'd like to add uh, that uh, I think all of us here in the panel, uh, we uh, have a responsibility, political, moral, whatever, and human rights responsibility to now fight the, uh, um, let's say, relative oblivion of Afghanistan and the public sphere. At least in Europe, you see how much Ukraine is taking of the attention. And uh, I don't know if that is why somebody very falsely accused Ambassador Gafursai of being silent. He is not. I can... I can actually attest to that. He's far from silent. He, wherever he has a chance to raise his voice about uh, the situation in Afghanistan, and wherever he's invited by the press or by any organizations he does. But a very good question about what the NGOs should do. I'm kind of a member, I was a founding member of the Norwegian Afghanistan Committee way back in 1980. Uh, I'm a sort of a passive member now, but I know that what they're doing is now putting some activities on hold due to that decree of women um, not being allowed to work for the NGOs. They said, we cannot work if we don't have women working for us. On the other hand, I mean, I get messages from people in Afghanistan, no doubt you also get that, about people freezing to death, about people starving. Even, I mean, academics with good education, they also starve, and then you can imagine the rest. So, I mean, this is a very complex dilemma, but I think the pressure has to be big, and we have to be as public speakers as we all are, to do whatever we can to get access to the public sphere and thus make our voices heard. You as Afghans, me as a very long-term friend of Afghanistan, to really see to that Afghanistan is not uh, pulled under the radar. And I think that is of vital importance, but also uh, combine that with always uh, talking about women, talking about human rights, and talking about press freedom, I have to add, which is very far from the truth now. Thank you so much for inviting me. I didn't say in the beginning, I say it now. And I hope we can stay in touch, some of us, after this. Thank you very much. Thank you, dear speakers. Thank you for your time. Thank you for the participants and the ones who have joined us online. Um, we, we don't have any other questions, and I think we are done with the time. And thank you for bearing with me when I was alarming about the time. Um, it was the session about the Norway's Taliban diplomacy conducted by Afghan Institute for Strategic Studies. 
and uh, thank you very much have a very good day evening and afternoon based on your time zones have a good day Bye -bye. thank you Bye. thank you Bye.